Greetings and welcome to this massive open online course introduction to bio-risk management. I am your instructor Kenneth and in the first lecture of this series I will introduce you to the fundamental principles of bio-risk management. The first lecture of this MOOC has been designed and developed in order to introduce you to the fundamental principles, concepts, terminologies and practices associated with the management of risks posed by biological agents. You have to understand that biorisk management is a very extensive area of expertise and you have to develop expertise based on existing guidelines. As researchers, we may assume that the biorisk management focuses purely on biological sciences. It also extends beyond that to the management aspects of biorisk. This includes the laboratory management perspective. And I will gradually introduce these concepts to you over the next four weeks. Each of these lectures has very specific learning objectives and specific learning outcomes. These are your learning objectives for the current lecture. The first one is to introduce you to the basic principle which is biosafety management and biosecurity management. Then we move on to the principles of biorisk management, the concept of containment, this will be our first concept, then a brief introduction to biological agents which I will expand upon in the next lecture. There are specific processes involving biological agents which I will discuss as well as the international guidelines and regulations. Everything which is introduced to you in this lecture will be expanded upon in the subsequent lectures. These are your learning outcomes for this particular lecture module. Okay, the first one is you should be able to differentiate between biosafety and biosecurity in terms of the definitions. The second one is to demonstrate an understanding of the overall process of biorisk management. What is biorisk management and what does it involve? The third one is the principle of containment. The fourth is the biological agents. The fifth is the laboratory processes that involve biological agents. And the sixth is to demonstrate a knowledge of the international manuals and guidelines. Okay, as an introduction, Viruses, bacteria and other pathogens have posed a challenge to human civilizations for millennia. We are now living in a globalized world in which there is increased global travel and trade and this results in the transmission of pathogens across boundaries. However, this is not new. In the early 18th century, there were pandemics and they have caused mortality across the world and this has been recorded. There may have been other pandemics which occurred prior to recorded history but we are not aware of what these pandemics actually caused and what are their effects on human civilization. However, we are now challenged by new aspects of pathogens. The first one is the emergence of new pathogens which exhibit, for instance, multi-drug tolerance or multi-drug resistance as well as synthetic biology and genetic engineering which enhances the capabilities of pathogens. And we also are faced with the added specter of bioterrorism. The first term which you need to understand is biosafety and biosecurity and this is a management term. In biosafety management we focus on mitigating the risk posed by the accidental release of a pathogen from a laboratory or a containment facility. And biosafety management fundamentally describes the containment principles, technologies and practices that are implemented to prevent the unintentional exposure to biological agents and toxins or their accidental release. This is a very specific definition which is adapted from the World Health Organization Laboratory Biosafety Manual. 
So the key principle is unintentional. There have been biosafety accidents. So there was an outbreak of pathogenic E. coli in 2011 and it's a foodborne pathogen which was transmitted via uncooked vegetables and there were fatalities. However, this is an accident. It is not an intent to release this pathogen. We now move on to biosecurity management and biosecurity management is basically focusing on intentional unauthorized release. This is where we enter into the domain of bioterrorism. Laboratory biosecurity describes the protection, control and accountability for biological agents and toxins within laboratories in order to prevent their loss, theft, misuse, diversion of unauthorized access or intentional unauthorized release. The key principle is intentional or intent. There have been biosecurity accidents and the most well known is the 2001 anthrax attacks which occurred after the September 11 uh, World Trade Center incidents and accidents and these have caused mortality and in this case there was an intent to release the pathogen in the public space and cause panic or maybe even an intent to cause harm. So this is an example of a biosecurity accident. We now move on to biorisk management. Why do we have to manage biorisk? The biological agent in itself does not pose a risk to society. However, when you do a process or carry out a process involving a biological agent, you increase the level of risk. This is because you may be culturing the virus or the, or the bacterium in the lab setting. Then you will be enhancing its capabilities by using rich nutrient medium. So you increase the likelihood of an accident. And this is where your role as a biorisk manager comes into play. Okay, but what we have to understand is that the process or research processes are critical for the development of therapeutics and we cannot restrict these researches into these particular pathogens. So biorisk ma management focuses on mitigating the risk posed by biological agents by the application of pertinent controls. I will describe all these terminologies in subsequent lectures. I have highlighted the keywords which are mitigating and controls. And there is al always a certain level of risk which is termed as the residual risk. What we adopt in biorisk management is what we call a management systems approach. There are some key fundamentals which you should note. The first one is basically that safety takes precedence over science. In this case, scientists may insist that they want to carry out the work, but it is at the jurisdiction of the top management as well as the authorization of the biosafety officer to determine whether this work can be carried out or not. The second aspect is top management drives the virus policy. Top management is accountable and responsible for driving the virus policy across an organization. They are responsible for setting goals, monitoring implementation and very important continuous quality improvement. This forms the foundation of virus management. The roles and responsibilities of everyone in the organization are very clearly defined right from the top management to the biorisk manager or biosafety officer right unto the level of the cleaners and the waste disposal personnel. Everyone's roles and responsibilities are clearly defined. And the biorisk manager or the biosafety officer must be empowered to suspend laboratory operations if they are not conducted in accordance with standard operating procedures. So it's a very restrictive system. However, it should be implemented by taking into account the input from all the stakeholders. This is the basic flow 
or what we call the cyclical process of continuous quality improvement. We plan an activity, we do an activity, we check and we act. For example, if I'm going to develop an SOP, I have to plan my SOP. Subsequent to that SOP, I have to implement that SOP, conduct a trial. Then I have to check whether that SOP is actually working. Is it mitigating the risk or not? And if not, I have to act and modify that SOP. So this process improves continually over a period of time. In biorisk management, we adopt what is known as the AMP model, which focuses on risk assessment, risk mitigation and performance assessment. This in itself is a cyclical process. Risk assessment focuses on asking some pertinent questions. For instance, what are the possible risks posed by working with biological agents? Are the facilities adequate? Are the laboratory personnel suitably trained to address the risk? Are the facilities secure? This is all related to infrastructure and training as well as the biological agent itself. Risk mitigation focuses on reducing the level of risk. This is where the term mitigation comes into play. You have to apply pertinent controls to mitigate the level of risk. And in some cases, you may have to apply more than one control and this application may have to be concurrent. The third step in the cycle is performance assessment in which you ask these questions via audits. Are the controls adequate? Has the risk of exposure been reduced? Have new risks emerged after the application of the controls? Have there been reports of accidents or incidents? And how can the biosafety level be improved upon? I have highlighted these specific terms because I will introduce the definitions for these terms in the course of this MOC. We now move on to another very important term, which is the word containment. The containment is a system for confining microorganisms, organisms or other entities within a defined space. And this defined space may relate to your containment facility or biosafety level 3 or 2 laboratory. Containment is divided further into primary and secondary containment. Primary containment focuses on the set of controls which protect the laboratory users from the biological agent. Personal protective equipment is a form of primary containment and administrative controls such as standard operating procedures also constitute primary containment. So this is an example of primary containment. So you have your biological agent sitting in your laboratory. You have your laboratory workers who are working with that biological agent and you have your primary containment or the primary barrier. This may be in the form of personal protective equipment or a biological safety cabinet. Secondary containment constitutes the set of controls which protect the environment and the laboratory user from the biological agent. Now we are extending our scope beyond the laboratory into the surrounding environment. This may involve physical containment such as the facility building itself as well as administrative controls and standard operating procedures. This is an example of secondary containment. So in our first example, we had our personnel working in the laboratory and they are protected from the biological agent. However, we also have our community which lives around the facility and the green circle represents the secondary containment which may be in the form of a laboratory facility that has been secured as well as a facility which may have adequate controls in terms of the waste disposal as well as in the sewage disposal. The third term which you need to understand is the breach of containment. So a breach of containment implies a temporary or permanent loss of the controls which limit the spread of the biological agent. 
For instance, if you have a sewage system in your laboratory and you do not manage the sewage system well and there's a leak and the sewage from the laboratory enters into the public drains, there can be a breach of containment. So in the case of breach of containment, there are consequences. People can get sick, it can pose a threat to public health and safety. So we need to put in adequate measures to mitigate any consequences posed by potential breaches in containment. This may involve the usage of specific standard operating procedures for emergency release of biological agents from the lab. I will touch upon biological agents very briefly before I discuss them in detail in the next lecture. A biological agent is any microorganism including those which have been genetically modified, cell cultures and endoparasites which may be able to provoke any infection, allergy or toxicity in humans, animals or plants. These are some examples of biological agents. So we have uh, bacteria, this is bacillus and bacillus anthracis is well known as the positive agent of anthrax and we have yeast such as candida albicans which also cause infection. We have viruses which are very well known and what is very little known is the prions or which are misfolded proteins. Okay, this is an example of a misfolded protein which can also cause harm. Then we have the yeast, the bacteria and the viruses. We now move on to manuals and guidelines. Now, when you want to commence the process of implementing biorisk management in your respective institution, you will have to reference specific manuals and guidelines. Now, please take note that these are guidelines. They will describe certain processes, but you need to develop your own biorisk bio management manual or your biosafety manual at your respective facility. Another aspect which you must note is the national laws and guidelines. There are specific national laws in your respective regions which you must address before you develop your laboratory biosafety manual. To begin with, we have the ISO 35001 2019. This is a biorisk management for laboratories and other related organizations. This is a very useful manual for the development of your laboratory management system. However, you need to purchase this manual online as it is copyrighted. It's only 28 pages long, but you must uh, reference the original text. I cannot distribute it as a part of this MOOC. Then we have the World Health Organization Laboratory Biosafety Manual. This is a very comprehensive document which we use as a reference for almost all of our procedures. We also have the Biosafety in Microbiological and Biomedical Laboratories, BMBL, Center for Disease Control and Prevention Reference Manual. Then we have the NIH guidelines for research involving recombinant or synthetic nucleic acid molecules. The CWA16393 is a CWA laboratory biorisk management guidelines for the implementation of CWA 15793-2008. I will be discussing these manuals in details and I will provide you with the links to all of these reference documents in the lecture notes. You may have to refer to specific national laws in your respective countries or regions and these may pertain to biosafety laws, genetic engineering laws, or occupational health and safety laws, and standards pertaining to biosafety and biorisk management. This brings us to the conclusion of the first lecture. In this lecture, I have introduced you to the principles of biosafety and biosecurity. Biosafety is based on the unintended release of a biological agent. Biosecurity, on the other hand, is based on the intentional release of a biological asset. I have introduced you to the basic principle of virus management. 
which is based on the AMT model, risk assessment, risk mitigation and performance assessment. I have also introduced you to the principle of containment, biological agents and some of the manuals and guidelines. In the next lecture, I will introduce you to the laboratory management system. Thank you very much for watching the first lecture and I look forward to your participation in the next lecture module. Thank you.